to see you here. Just going to fight with Ian over this table. Where would you want this table, Ian? <laughs> we'll put it off to one side. Really, really lovely to uh, be here again. And it, it uh, is nice to see some familiar faces. And if it's the right way to say it, it's really, really lovely to see some new faces here today. And really lovely to see what the Lord has been doing in your midst and uh, how the Lord's blessing all of you. And I hope that that blessing will continue as we open God's Word today. I want to pray for my son. We had breakfast. So I was watching him have breakfast. I think he had no idea that I was going to be here today. So I feel for you, bro. I really do. <laughs> he let me go at breakfasting, and that's the last time I'll see Dad today. Hallelujah. But here he is up the front. That's really, really tough, isn't it? So I want to ask you the question, what is the main thing in your life? What's the, what's the main reason for you being here on the face of the earth? What's your main, main, main reason in life? I thought deeply about that when I was a young man, and that's what led me to search out something deeper than what I had. That's what led me to Christ. That's what made me think there's got to be more to life than what I have now and what isn't. And at that time, for me, that was to know Jesus Christ personally. And he transformed my life. And here I am some years later asking the same question, why am I here on earth? And that's the one I want us to wrestle with. Before we do that, I'd like to pray with you. And then I want to take you into 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll try and answer that for you today. Father, thank you for the precious people that have gathered here today. I thank you for the privilege of being able to open your word. And I pray as we open your word that you would speak to us, that you would give me the words to speak, because there's certainly some poverty in my case when I come to a passage so beautiful. I pray that you would open the hearts of these people. I pray that you would help us to really think seriously about the claims of 2 Corinthians 5, and we would apply those to our lives. Amen. There's a, a really wonderful minister of, uh, of the gospel, a guy called Mac Stiles, and Mac is ministering in North Africa and Tunisia. And he talked about the experience of going to Tunisia and working amongst Arab people. He came from a very, very small American town where they had, from his words were, they had a TV view of Arabs, a TV view of Muslims. And that was his TV view as he explained it. And it sounds very blunt, blunt and very brutal, but stay with me for a moment. He said, my TV view of uh, Arabs were that they were all Muslims by faith. They all were Muslims, every single one of them. They all owned guns, and they would all be happy to kill an American. And then God in his wisdom called Mac to North Africa to move, work amongst uh, Muslim people. And while he was in Tunisia, he met this wonderful young student. He was helping assimilate students into an English-speaking home so that they could learn to speak English. And he met this really lovely young guy called Haddam, and Haddam had a, a really awesome sense of humor. And one day Mac was talking to him, and he said, Mac, what's your... So rather, uh, he said, Haddam, what's your TV view of Americans? And he said, well... He said, all Americans are Christians, all Americans own guns, all Americans would be happy to kill an Arab. And they both laughed about that. They became really great friends. They one day uh, had him invited Mac to go to a beach. It was really a Muslim beach where all the tourists wouldn't go, just Muslim families and a place where they could relax and enjoy their family. A beautiful beach. And when Mac was there, he noticed about 30 metres off the, the shore was a, a sandbank. And he said to Haddam, why don't we swim out at the sandbank? And Haddam said in his uh, accent, he said, no, I'm, go I'm going to take a smoke. And so he wanted to go and have a smoke. So Mac thought, oh, well, I'll swim out. So he's swimming out to the sandbank. And he noticed all of a sudden underneath him, had him swimming under the water, trying to beat him out to the sandbank. So Mac thought, oh, I'll have him. So he swam along behind him, just stayed a little bit behind him all the way out there. And then when Haddam came up, Mac grabbed him around the neck and dunked him under the water, <laughs> brought him up, and he was spluttering and coughing. He thought, I'll just take him down for good measure. Went down again and leave him again. Spun him around. And to Mac's surprise, it wasn't Haddam. <laughs> <laughs> It was a non-English speaking Tunisian man who believed that an American terrorist had come to his beach to kill him. So as Mac was trying to explain, look, I'm really sorry, this fellow's backing up to the beach and backing up to the beach and Mac's swimming after him saying, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. And as Mac started to get towards the beach, he noticed that this Tunisian man's family had gathered on the beach. They had seen what had happened and he noticed that some of those relatives of this man were quite buff. 
Mac began to realise that his life was about to come to an end on a Muslim beach. You could see the headline, American terrorist killed on Muslim beach. As he came out of the water, he was trying to explain to all these non-English speaking people what it was going on. And just then, Haddam comes along the beach smoking and says to Mac, what's going on? <laughs> just like that, sounded more French than Muslim, but there you go. <laughs> we'll do, do some of that later. And so Mac explained to Haddam what had happened. Well, Haddam was just weeping with laughter. He thought that was hilarious. He explained to the family what was going on. They started to have tears of laughter running down their face. They invited Mac into their large tent. They had a beautiful ornate tent on the beach. They invited him in for lunch. He said it was one of the most wonderful afternoons that he'd had in his whole life. But Mac reflects on that. He said, when I came out of the water, he said, what I needed was an ambassador. I needed somebody to represent me to that family because they did not understand one word that I was saying. And thank goodness for him at that time, Haddam was his ambassador. And what I want to suggest to you today is that God has called us to the ministry of ambassadors. He's called us to represent him on this earth to those people who don't know God, to those people who need to know him before it's too late. I want to suggest to you that the reason that you are here, here on this earth is to be a reconciler, is to be that person who goes out on behalf of God and reconciles men and women to come and know God, to reconcile men and women to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to go out as, as his ambassador and explain to people who are lost, who are in peril, that there is a way of escape, that there is a way that their sins can be forgiven and they can be made right with God, they can be reconciled with God. I want to suggest to you when you open your Bibles and come with me into 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll start just for the moment, I want to show you four things from verses 17 to 21. I want to ask you to look at this passage with me and honestly ask yourselves, are you that ambassador? Are you fully convinced that as a child of God that you are a minister of reconciliation? I want to ask you if you can excuse yourself from this passage. I want to ask you if you can really deny the fact that the only reason you are here right now on the face of this earth is because God is wanting to use you to represent him to a lost world. So let's begin together as we look at this wonderful, wonderful passage. Reconciliation, the reason we are here. And the first thing you'll see if you come with me into verse 17 is reconciliation is by the will of God. Have a look there. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This incredibly all-encompassing statement that we are now new creations, that God has done something wonderful. And the first thing I want you to see about reconciliation is reconciliation is by the word of God. Look at the first part of verse 18. He says in the first part of verse 18, this is from God. God who is, is the true reconciler. God is the, the author of reconciliation. God is the one who has initiated this wonderful message, this wonderful gift that man can be made right with God again. God is the one who has done that in our lives. He has made us, what does it say in verse 17? He has made us a new creation. The whole ministry of reconciliation and this wonderful privilege that you and I have to be ambassadors for Christ has been done and initiated and worked through by the living God. He is the one who brought the conviction of sin that changed our lives. He is the one who has brought conversion. He is the one who made salvation possible. He is the one who made sanctification possible. He is the one who made the new birth possible. All this work has been done by God for us. And God has made us a minister of that beautiful thing. He's made us a new creation. Many people paint God as a, a very angry God. If you talk about the Muslim faith, their God is a very, very distant God who is unapproachable, effectively unknowable. A God who will judge sin, and he will judge sin mercilessly. He's a God to be feared. A distant God, though. 
You go into the Old Testament and you look at some of the Old Testament gods. Some of the Old Testament gods weren't just unknowable. Some of the Old Testament gods were vicious. The god Malak was vicious. To reconcile with him or to be forgiven of sin from him meant that you had to do certain things. And that certain thing was to offer your child, to burn your child alive so that you could be made right with Malak. That's the sort of God he was. But our God, the God of the Bible, the God who has done this work of making us ambassadors and ministers of reconciliation, our God is a God of reconciliation. Our God is a God of mercy. Our God, by nature, is a God who offers us salvation. He offers us forgiveness. He offers us grace. Our God is a God of reconciliation. He is the one that has actually done the work. So when we talk about being ministers of reconciliation, it's not what we're doing. It's what God has done and now what God is doing through us. When we talk about speaking to people about mercy, it's not our mercy. It's the mercy of God. And now through his grace, we get to speak about his mercy. When we think about speaking about how wonderful and kind our God is, it's not because we've made him wonderful and kind, it's because he's always been wonderful and kind and merciful. And now we have the honour of not only being reconciled to him and being given a new nature and being new people, but now we have the honour of being able to go out into our community and be ministers of reconciliation. That's every single one of you who know him. Every single one of you. It's not just for special people. It's not just for ministers of special things. It's not for those who have been trained at Bible college. It's not those who have just been given a a gift of speaking and leadership. The ministry of reconciliation is for every single child of God. And that ministry has been given to us by the living God. It's from God. Have a look in verse 19. It was Christ who was reconciling. It's Christ who was doing the work. Verse 20, God making his appeal through us. All this work is from God. He's a reconciling God. Catholic theology tells us that God is an angry God. That sometimes God is so hard and so angry, you can't actually approach him. You might think, well, I'll go to the Lord Jesus Christ, but... He too might not be open to you and he may be hard towards you and not willing to receive you. And so Catholic theology says, go to Mary. Mary is beautiful. She is kind and she's tender and she will always receive you because Mary is a mother and she will extend to you a mother's love and she will go on your behalf to Jesus and she'll bring your appeal to Jesus and he won't refuse her because she is his mother. And so then he will take your appeal to the Father and the Father won't reject the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus is his son. That's how you get your request before God and nothing could be more blasphemous because our God is a reconciling God. Our God is a loving God. Our God is a God who does hear our prayers and does answer our prayers. Our God is the one who has reached out to us even when we were not willing to reach out to him. It is our God who has manufactured this. It is our God who has put this in place. It is our God who has made it possible for us to know him. Our God, the God of the Bible, is a reconciling kind. You must be crazy, Jeff. Have you not read the Old Testament? Because the Old Testament is full of stories of God killing people, assassinating people, wiping them off the face of the earth. Have you forgotten about that part of the Bible, Jeff? In fact, the question you should be asking when you read the old question is not why did God kill people, but why did God leave anybody alive? Because God tells us that our sin must be judged and the wages of sin is death. And the Bible tells us that we were born in sin. And the truth is, The Old Testament shows because of the loving way that God dealt with the people in the Old Testament that he is actually a merciful, reconciling God that he left any of them alive. He said to Adam, the day you eat of that tree you shall die. And then 900 years later he died. There's some wrongs about that. 
Why did God leave him like that for 900 years? Isn't that the mercy of God? That he would leave him and let him learn of God and grow and mature? God is a gracious, loving God. He is the, the author of reconciliation. Have a look in your Bibles at verse 19. The second thing I want you to see is that reconciliation is only possible by an act of forgiveness. Verse 19, that, that is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. Did you like the way I punctuated that? Didn't make any sense at all, did it? In Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. Not counting, what does it say? Are you awake with me? Come on. Not counting there trespasses against them. God had a huge problem if he wanted to reconcile us to himself, and that was that there needed to be forgiveness. Because clearly we have offended God. We've broken his law. We have, we have blasphemed him. We have sinned openly against him. We have heard his truth and walked away from it. And now there is a need for forgiveness. And if God is truly the reconciling God, then he's going to have to do something about forgiveness. He's going to have to find a way to draw us together again. And we are not the one who can make that reconciliation happen. God is the one who is offended. God is the one who needs to be, as it were, reached out to and sought, and we need to ask him to forgive us. But how does God offer us forgiveness? tells us in the Bible that God has cast our sins as far as the east is from the... Do you know this one? Far as the east is from the west. Isn't that, doesn't that rock? That's how far God has cast our sins away, the guilt that we have suffered through our sinfulness. God is the one who has organized it for us to be able to be forgiven. He says that he will forgive our sins and that he will remember them no more. He says that he will dismiss our sins, that he will put them to one side and, and he will not look on them anymore and he will not judge us for them anymore and he will treat us as though we are sinless, forgiven. He said he'd do that for us. Have a look in Ephesians chapter 1. It should come up on the screen for you. Look at that. Verses, uh, verse 7, in him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. It is God who has initiated and made forgiveness possible. When you have two people that are fighting with each other, generally, this has been my experience, if you're in a husband and wife situation, it's always the husband's fault. Um, if you're in any, any other relationship, it's a 50-50 to some extent. There's, there's, there's sin on both sides. That's been my experience in life. And so when you want reconciliation or forgiveness to happen there, you, you come to each other and there's a sense of where you both reach out to each other and you both offer each other forgiveness and there's reconciliation. And that's the way it has to be as human beings because we're all sinful. But with God, there is no sin. He is pure. There is no shadow of sinfulness. There's no shadow of doubt. There's no shadow of anything wrong within God. God is, as the angels have cried out in Revelation, he is holy, holy, holy. Do you see the dilemma that we're in? Do you see why reconciliation is so beautiful? Do you see how a loving God who has been wholly offended, who has been dealt with completely unjustly by us, and has no good reason why he should forgive us. And yet he has gone out of his way and he's offered us forgiveness. He's offered to cast our sins away. He's offered to remember them no more. How wonderful and amazing is our God. And you have been given with me the privilege of being able to go out and tell our community, this is who the one true God is that made you in his image. He is a God who wants to reconcile with you. And he has already made it possible through what he has done. And he is offering you forgiveness for your sins so that you can be right with God again. What an honor it is to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. He has made it possible for you and I to be treated as though we have never, ever sinned. 
You can stand before the living God in relationship with him and look him squarely in the face. And because of what he has done and the forgiveness that you, he has offered you, we can stand there as though we have never, ever sinned. Our God is a forgiving God. The third thing I want you to see about the ministry of reconciliation, that reconciliation is only possible by obedient faith. I want you to come with me in your Bibles again and have a look at verse 20. Reconciliation is only possible by obedient faith. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This doesn't make sense. We implore you. The word implore is a beautiful word. It's a beautiful word. The word means to, to beg. The word means to ask. The word means to plead. And the picture as ambassadors is that we go out into our community and we beg people and we plead with people and we do all we can to be able to make them reconcile with God to, to realize that God has made it possible for them to be forgiven of their sins, which makes no sense at all. Why would people have to be begged and pleaded with and, and cajoled and called upon and asked again and again and again to consider this? Isn't it the best offer that you have ever heard that the God who created us in his image, whom we have sinned against and broken his law and blasphemed his name, is willing to offer us forgiveness and treat us as though we have never sinned against him? Now, that's got to be the best offer you've heard this week, that we can be made right with the creator God, and yet people reject it out of hand. People tell us to go away. People tell us we're foolish. When people feel the conviction of sin come on their lives, they often reject that conviction and they cling to their sin. And the reason they do this is because the Bible calls it as it really is, and that is that we love the darkness. We love our sin. We love to be in the darkness. We love to flee from the light. We love to cling on to those things that are abhorrent to God. When I first heard the gospel as a young guy, and try to get your head around this, I was like seven foot tall, dark and handsome. I was just awesome. And uh, then I had an accident and ended up like this. <laughs> and I remember as a young guy weighing it up, almost had two lists of this is what's going to happen when I become a Christian, I'm going to be forgiven of my sins and I'm going to go to church and I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to hang out with all these weird blokes at school. And on the other list I had, I can't drink anymore, I can't smoke anymore, I can't drink anymore, I can't smoke anymore, I can't go out with girls anymore, I can't have fun, I can't have fun, I can't have fun, I've got to have a sour face, life is going to be boring. And the list over here was really long and the one over here was really short and that was because I didn't understand the gravity of what was going on. I didn't understand the wonderful offer that God was making me that I could be reconciled to him. This is the reality is that men love their sins. We cling to our sins. Luke, 7, uh, Luke 13 says that we strive. We, we strive against God. God is pleading with us, yet we strive against him because we don't want to receive the grace that he has given us. When the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4 went back to his hometown and spoke this wonderful word of reconciliation to the people who knew him for 30 years, to people who had loved him, to people whom he had done work for, he went to his own synagogue where he worshipped with them since he was a young man. And when he told them about the ministry of reconciliation, do you think that they reached out for that? No, what they did was they clung to their self-righteous ways and they took Jesus to the edge of the cliff and they were going to throw him off. They were going to kill him. Men love their sin. And this is why God says that part of the ministry of reconciliation is that we, people have to obey in obedient faith. People have to come to a point where they say, I'm going to live the old way behind me and I'm going to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ with all of my heart. And how many of you here have done that? Do you remember that time when you first trusted the Lord Jesus Christ? There was a clear decision in your life that I'm going to leave my old life behind and I'm going to follow after the Lord and trust him with all that I do. So part of the ministry of reconciliation is obedient faith. 
we must beg people and implore people. This has really challenged me personally when I've thought about it. I've had the opportunity to minister the word of reconciliation to neighbours and friends, and I do it once, and I think, beauty, done that. Don't have to worry about it anymore. It's their problem now. See them walking down the street the next day. No, not my problem anymore. You, I told you once, and if you don't get it right, tough luck, you can burn. Fairly caring neighbour. Aren't you glad you don't live next door to me? Although you soon will. <laughs> and I realised, actually, I need to continue to go back again and again and again. I've got a friend who I met a little over a year and a half ago, and we sat down in my office, and we went through the Alpha course that you've been invited to. And he seemed to respond in faith, seemed to come through to a point. But over the last six months, he's fallen away and has gone back. And it would be really easy for me to say, well, I tried. I spent like 12 months with him, and I've been a friend to him, and just let him go. He can go and do his own thing. And as I looked at this passage, I realized, no, I've got to go and implore him and beg him and cry out to him and ask him to let go of his sin and to let go of his old way of his life and cling to God's forgiveness. What an honour it is to be a minister of reconciliation. One last thing that I want to share to you that's got four subsections. Come with me into verse 20, 21, okay? Verse 21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the key verse. This is where it really all happens. You must, if you miss all the rest that I've said, please get your heads around this part. There are two parts to this that I want you to see. And the first part of that verse says to us, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. How can, the question is, how can a a just God justify a sinner? How can a, a just God justify a sinner and still remain just? How can a holy God forgive ungodly people and still remain a holy God? Because a holy God can have nothing to do with sin. A holy God cannot wink at sin. A holy God cannot just dismiss sin. Sin requires a payment. There must be justice involved here. If God is just, he must judge sin. And the Bible tells us that the penalty of sin is death. So then how can he come and tell us that he will cast our sins as far as the east is from the west? He must be a liar. How can he tell us that he will remember our sins no more? He must be mocking us to say that because he's already told us that our sin requires death. There must be a payment. If I was the judge of a court and a man stood before me who was a mass murderer and they laid out all the evidence and all the witnesses gave their evidence and it was a watertight case, he even confessed to what he had done. And just about before I was about to pass sentence, he said, look, Jeff, I want to tell you I'm really sorry for what I've done. I've seen the error of my ways and I ask you to please forgive me. And I look at him and I think, yeah, that's fair enough. He's a nice guy when he's not killing people. And I feel compassion for him, so I'm just going to let him off. I don't think I'd be a judge for very long. Can you imagine how those families would feel if I judged that man like that? Those families would be outraged. They would likely want to take my life for the ones that have been lost. How can God be a just God and forgive sin? And this is the, the, the heart of this passage. The way that God forgives our sins is that he's placed the guilt of our sin on a substitute. Now hear this. This is really key. He has placed your guilt, my guilt, all the sins in the world, he has placed them on a substitute. And that substitute has suffered the judgment that I deserve to suffer. That substitute has suffered what you deserve to suffer. That substitute has taken upon us. He became sin in our place. Does that mean that Jesus Christ, I'm speaking of here if you haven't picked it up, Jesus Christ is the only substitute. There is only one substitute, Jesus Christ. God in the flesh who lived amongst us and he knew no sin. He is the spotless lamb of God. And he hung on the cross and died in my place and your place. He took upon himself 
the judgment of God that we deserved. And this is how God remains a just God. He did not just wave his hand over sin and said, I'm just going to forget it. What he did was he sent his only son to pay the price so that he could forgive us of our sin. Why? Because he's such a loving God. That's how much he loves us. Jesus Christ is our substitute. Does it mean that Jesus became a sinner? Absolutely not. When he hung on that cross, he was the spotless lamb of God. What it means when it says in the scriptures that he became sin for us, what it means is he bore the penalty of our sin. He bore the penalty of our sin, separated from God on our behalf. Jesus, the spotless lamb of God, our substitute. Isn't it great to have a substitute? <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, my brothers were substitutes for me. If anything went wrong in the yard, it was Dan's fault or Mark's fault. It wasn't my fault. They became a substitute. Dad, beat them with a stick. Don't beat me. I stand before you today, and I'm not a, a man without sin. I am, to my shame, I am a sinful man. But when my God looks upon me, he sees me as sinless, not because of what I have done, but what my substitute has done. He has borne all of my guilt, and now my Father in heaven looks on me as though I am sinless. Isn't that great? And that's not just me, that's you. You beat yourself up. You remind yourself, like I have many times, how broken and how wicked you are. And perhaps you are right to do that, but then does not God call you to forsake that by coming to him and asking him to forgive you of your sins and he will cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness? And why can he offer that for you day by day, moment by moment? Because Jesus Christ is your substitute and he paid for your past, present and future sin. Hallelujah. What a friend we have in Jesus. Do you get the import of that song now? And this is the message we take to our community. Man, you don't have to be in your sin anymore and separated from God. Give your sin up and cling to the forgiveness that God offers you through Christ, your substitute. What a wonderful, wonderful message. And as we come to a close, look at the second part of that verse because it just gets better. Not only is he our substitute, but it says in the last part of that verse, so that in him we might become, what does it say? The righteousness of God. So it's not just that Jesus Christ has borne the penalty of our sin. Now his righteousness has been accredited to me. When Jesus hung on the cross, he was sinless. And now that righteous act that he committed on the cross, the credit for that has been credited to my account. I have a substitute. You have a substitute. God who is a merciful, reconciling God who has reached out to you. Do you understand now? when the scriptures say that you are like a sheep that's gone astray and we get a picture of the Father coming out to tend to you, this is because God's a reconciled. Do you get the import now of Luke 15 when we talk about the prodigal son and the, the prodigal son who has lived a, a worthless life and squandered his father's blessings comes over the crest of the hill and his father, and in this picture the father is God, make no mistake about it, he takes up the uh, clothing that he was wearing, his tunic, he pulls it up, and he runs through the middle of the village and he doesn't care who sees him because he wants to fall upon his son and he wants to tell him that he is a reconciling God who is willing to forgive him. And we are that wicked son, that wicked, wicked son. And our reconciling father, when we had no ability to reconcile with him, came after us. And I've got to tell you, that just fills my lungs with joy. Because we were all together, we were stuffed. And we had no way of escape of the judgment that was coming. And then Jesus, our substitute, appears, takes the penalty for my sin, and now I stand before the living God as righteous. Hallelujah. And there will come a day very soon when I'll stand before my living God, and I'll, not only will I be free from the penalty of sin, but I'll be free from the power of sin in my life and I'll be free from the presence of sin. The Apostle Paul cries out, oh, who will deliver me from this body of death? He, he felt the same pain that we do, knowing that we're right before God and yet often being quite broken in his behaviour. And there'll come a day where we'll see him and we will be like him. We will go into his presence and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. 
we are reconciled to our God. This is the reason you are here on earth. The only reason. It's not to have babies, which is a relief to all of us men. It's not to make money. It's not to build a house. It's not to live by the beach. It's not to find someone special in your life. They're just, that's just grace. All that stuff's just grace. The reason you are here is that you are a minister of reconciliation. You are an ambassador. You are a person who goes out and tells people you can be reconciled to God. There's only one thing that you won't do in heaven. And that is you won't tell an unbeliever how they can know God as their saviour. Because the ministry of reconciliation will be finished. The reason you're here now is for the ministry of reconciliation and if it wasn't, God would take you home. There's no other purpose for you here. Your purpose here is to be a minister of reconciliation. And the way you do that is through acts of service and love to your community. It's caring for your neighbours. It's praying for your neighbours. It's loving your neighbours. It's living for Christ in your workplace. It's being like Christ to everyone around you. And that's another message. Let's pray together as we close.